Welcome to the Smith & Nephew Digital Education module on the T of Time. It forms part of the Time series which you can access to develop your knowledge and understanding around wound care. The module focuses on wound assessment and management of non-viable or deficient tissue. By the end of this module you will be able to understand what non-viable tissue is, how non-viable tissue should be assessed and recall methods of debridement and how they're used. During wound assessments, both the wound size and tissue type should be determined as they give an indication of the wound status, for example, healing, static or deteriorating. This enables the clinician to monitor the rate of healing and help predict which wounds are likely or unlikely to heal with conventional treatment. Wound measurements can also help identify wounds as healing or non-healing. A 40% reduction in wound size over a four week period can give a positive indication of the patient's progressive wound healing status. Wound measurements with a ruler or wound tracing typically capture the greatest length and width of the wounds. These measurements can be documented and reviewed regularly as part of an ongoing wound assessment. Commonly identified tissue types are necrosis, slough, epithelial or granulating tissue. Identifying and documenting these tissue types and percentage of tissue affected can help determine if the treatment plan is working. For example, new and healthy epithelial or granulating tissue can help confirm if the wound is healing, whereas an increase in necrotic or sluffy tissue can suggest the wound is deteriorating. Whilst the presence of granulating tissue suggests a healing wound, it's important to note that it can be an indication of either healthy or unhealthy soft tissue repair. Healthy granulating tissue is characterised by its raspberry red, pink granular appearance, which mainly comprise of fibroblasts, collagen and a rich capillary network of newly formed blood vessels through angiogenesis. Good formation of healthy granulating tissue in the wound bed is regarded as an intermediate indicator of wound healing, while poor formation is a feature of non-healing chronic wounds. Hypergranulation can be a sign of unhealthy granulating tissue, often noted as excessive vascular tissue. This can be friable and bleed easily. In addition, there may be evidence of epithelial bridging and soft tissue pocketing, often associated with tissue breakdown and wound enlargement. In some cases, new increasing pain or malodor. For this section, we will refer to the T in time, tissue non-viable or deficient. The goal is to assess for and identify the type of non-viable tissue and establish a plan and goals for management. There are typically two primary types of non-viable tissue found in chronic wounds, slough or eschar. Slough is usually yellow or tan and may be moist, mucus-like or stringy and fibrous. Slough is often a mixture of fibrin, degraded collagen or devitalised tissue. Eschar or necrotic tissue represents deeper soft tissue damage. It's usually black, brown or grey. Esker may be moist, soggy, dry, leathery, hard or crusty. Slough and esker are often documented as a percentage of the wound bed. The presence of non-viable tissue is a barrier to wound progress. So how do we manage this barrier? Wound debridement can help reveal the true dynamics of the wound, including the size and depth. The removal of dead and devitalised tissue can help create an optimal wound healing environment by producing a well vascularised, stable wound bed with minimal exudate. The act of wound bed preparation is initiated by cleansing the wound and surrounding skin to remove debris, loose non-viable tissue, microorganisms and exudate. This may be accomplished with normal saline, commercial cleansers or in some cases sterile water. A wound with non-viable or necrotic tissue will remain in the inflammatory phase of healing. Debridement or removal of the non-viable tissue is the intervention which plays a vital role in the wound bed preparation and progressive wound healing. In addition to improving wound visualisation, debridement removes bacteria, reducing the risk of infection and wound odour, promoting an environment for wound healing. It's important to note that the debridement is contraindicated for non-affected lower extremity wounds related to arterial insufficiency. These wounds have limited blood supply to support healing. 
Additionally, debridement should not be conducted on intact eschar on the heels of non-ambulatory patients. Let's discuss some of the most common debridement methods. Debridement methods fall into two categories, selective debridement and non-selective debridement. Selective debridement can be autolytic, enzymatic, larvae or conservative sharp debridement. Non-selective debridement can be mechanical, surgical or high pressure irrigation. The choice of wound debridement methods will be determined by a number of factors such as wound condition, patient's needs and available resources. Autolysis or autolytic debridement involves the body's own white blood cells and natural enzymes to destroy and remove non-viable tissue while leaving healthy tissue intact. During the inflammatory phase of healing, autolytic debridement occurs naturally in patients with an adequate leukocyte function and a moist vascularised wound. Autolysis is slow and therefore not ideal for infected wounds. Any dressings that will maintain a moist environment can help promote autolytic debridement. Enzymatic debridement involves the application of topical enzymes to remove necrotic tissue from the wound. A faster debridement than autolysis, collagen selectively removes necrotic tissue by digesting the collagen where it is attached to the wound base and does not harm the granulating tissue. When managing infected wounds which need debridement, Collagenase may be used in conjunction with topical antibiotics and antimicrobial dressings. It's important to note that collagenase is not compatible with iodine or silver and should not be used in conjunction with those products. Dosing of collagenase is important. A 2mm layer should be applied once or twice daily and covered with an appropriate dressing. Thick, thick dry esker may need to be cross-hatched or scored with a scalpel before application of topical enzymes. Cross-hatching should be conducted by qualified clinicians. Maggot therapy is a type of biosurgical wound debridement involving the application of live disinfected larvae to the non-healing wound bed. The larvae are produced by a green bottle blowfly. They are necrophages, which means they selectively debride the wounds by only feeding on dead and dead devitalised tissue. Proteolytic enzymes are secreted by the maggots into the surrounding environment. These enzymes help dissolve the wound escar and slough, which is then ingested by the maggots. Maggot secretions are known to have a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity. The metabolic byproduct of maggot is ammonia. This has been known to alter the pH, preventing recolonisation of bacteria in the wound. Larval therapy has the ability to rapidly and selectively debride a wound. However, not all patients and clinicians are receptive to the therapy because they think it may be distasteful and due to the higher unit cost may be considered expensive compared to other selective debridement options. Conservative sharp debridement includes the use of sterile instruments to remove loose adherent necrotic tissue. No bleeding is expected as only non-viable tissue is removed. Conservative sharp debridement may be performed only by qualified clinicians. Some methods of debridement require specialist training. Check your employer's policies and procedures in relation to the debridement procedures you are allowed to perform. Monofilament debridement pads contain a large number of polyester fibres of a specific size and thickness. The soft fleecy side of the pad is used to apply gentle cleansing action to the wound and surrounding skin area if indicated. A separate pad may be used to treat different wound areas. The, debri the debridement pad monofilaments encourage the physical or mechanical removal of wound debris without damaging tissue of the area being treated. The wound debridement pad has been noted for its ease of use and well tolerated by patients. Surgical debridement is almost always conducted in the operating room or special procedures area with the patient anaesthetised. It's performed with a scalpel, laser or hydrosurgical device. While surgical debridement is considered non-selective debridement, hydrosurgical debridement allows the surgeon to debride well, sparing healthy tissue. Faster than other methods, surgical debridement is usually the method of choice to remove large areas of necrotic tissue or for wounds with progressing cellulitis, wound-related sepsis and or infected bone or hardware that must be removed. 
Risks associated with the surgical procedure must be taken into consideration. Anesthesia, bleeding and infection. Surgical debridement must be performed by surgeons or an advanced practice clinician, such as a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, trained for surgical debridement. Name the non-viable tissue types in the photos. The wound on the left contains slough. On the right, it's eschar. What are some options of debridement? Conservative, sharp, surgical, biosurgical, enzymatic, mechanical or autolytic. To check your knowledge and understanding, try to answer the quiz questions. Why is the wind measurement important? It indicates the rate of healing and indicates if a wind is static, healing or deteriorating. What are the commonly used terms of tissue types? Necrotic, slough, epithelial and granulating. What are the types of debridement? Mechanical, autolytic, enzymatic, larvae, sharp conservative, surgical debridement. You have now completed this module. Take the time to reflect on how you will take some of what you've learned and apply it into your daily clinical practice. If you are on the NMC register, then please click the link shown to access a copy of the revalidation form. Simply put the title of the session on the form and file it into your portfolio. Thank you for your time today. Please remember to look at the other sections to access other modules to help you and your learning journey.